Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin, and this is Life, Liberty, and Levin. And I've been waiting for you to see this show for several weeks. This is the interview of interviews with President Trump, an interview like you've never seen before. And I say this because he's come out with a new book called Letters to Trump. And he's got letters in this book from politicians and actors and entertainers and foreign leaders and sports stars. You're not going to believe the kinds of letters he got and what these people said. And during the course of this interview, we talk about these individuals and we apply it to current events and to history. The president does a fantastic interview if you let him speak. And that's exactly what I did. This interview was conducted literally minutes before the rogue prosecutor in Manhattan came down with his decision. So this was the last interview before that occurred. I really want you to check this out. And by the way, you can get the book at 45books.com, Amazon.com. This is the exclusive first interview. And ladies and gentlemen, the book comes out on Tuesday. Enjoy. It's a pleasure to be in Mar-a-Lago. This is a fantastic place. It's amazing. Thank you. Well, we're going to have a good time here. Um, I'm not Andrew Mitchell, as you can tell. I'm not Maggie Haberman. I'm not here to play games and tricks and all the rest. You have a book that's coming out that's a fantastic book, Letters to Trump. Throughout your life, throughout your career as a businessman, you're on TV, politics. And as I went through this book, it's actually quite amazing. Sports, all these people writing you these letters. And they all love you. I want to talk about some of these people because this is really, it's a book of letters, but it's a fantastic history. And I think you can uh, help us talk about it a little bit too. Oprah Winfrey, she writes you three letters that you have in the book. She adores you. She writes, only a king knows how to treat a queen, you being the king, she being the queen. She would visit you at Mar-a-Lago often. And uh, now she says, well, that was 20 years ago. What do you make of that? Well, I haven't changed, and my views haven't changed very much. I think I've been pretty consistent over the years. We want security. We want a great country. We want a strong military. We want borders, and we want good elections and education and housing and everything. I certainly haven't changed very much. I think the thing that changes, I ran for office. She actually says in one of her letters, I think somewhat kiddingly, but we should run together what a team would be. And I put that letter in the book. Uh, look, I get along great with her. She was here many times. In fact, Roger King, the great Roger King, King World, uh, she asked whether or not we could have his funeral here. That was probably one of the most important, maybe the most important, but one of the most important people in her life. And uh, he was a fantastic man. He did an incredible job, a real character. He was a friend of mine also. We had his funeral here. It was held by Oprah. And she said, I just saw the most incredible place in the world called Mar-a-Lago. We have to have the funeral there. And, uh, you know, we don't do funerals, but we did one in that case. And it was amazing. Now, I had a great relationship with Oprah, a great relationship with almost everybody. But once I went into politics, and I don't mean I said something offensive. I mean, literally, once I went in, it was, it changed. And that was okay, because I just want to make our country great. I, you know, if, if they like me and then they don't like me, that doesn't bother me. I want to make our country great. But it is incredible when you look at the difference between those letters and now. Now, in some cases, people like me better. I will tell you, the public probably likes me better because we have tremendous support. We're in Texas, as you know, and we had an unbelievable crowd, record-setting crowds, record-setting like nobody's ever seen before. You saw it. We're doing very well, and we have to do well because if we don't do it, if we don't get this back, if we don't take our country back, we're not going to have a country. It's literally, we're not going to have its total chaos. It's a mess. Every single thing you see in the news, uh, Ukraine, Russia should have never happened. Inflation should have never happened. Every single thing, uh, the, the way we pulled out of Afghanistan, where we gave them $85 billion, billion, $85 billion worth of equipment, the best. You know, this, they're the second largest arms dealer in the world right now. We gave it to them, brand new trucks, brand new planes, brand new uh, guns, rifles, 700,000 rifles and guns. Think of that. 700,000. They only need 40,000. Probably not even that. So they're selling the rest, making a fortune. We left it there. And I was the one that was getting out. I got them down. You know, it was enough. 21 years, it was enough. And 
We didn't have anybody killed in the last 18 months. I spoke to Abdul, the leader. We had nobody killed. We had no, everybody understood. And we were going to get out with dignity and strength. Instead, I think it was the most embarrassing, I think it was the most embarrassing period, the way we withdrew. Not the fact that we withdrew, the way we withdrew from Afghanistan. And uh, I think Putin actually saw that, and he probably got a little more ambition, frankly. Let me ask you a question about that. You have really fascinating letters in here from Putin, from Xi, from Un in North Korea. And I can go on and on. And what I notice there's a common thread. You had a personal relationship with every one of these leaders, whether they're genocidal sure. maniacs, whether they're elected, like Abe of Japan, who was a close friend of yours and was assassinated. And I want to get into some of this. What would you say your foreign policy is? Because I think people keep projecting onto your foreign policy what it is that they think they want people to think your foreign policy is. What would you say it is? So I think more than anything else, and it was a very personal relationship, and, you know, it was sort of a weird situation. The tougher they were, the better I got along with them. And that's probably a good thing, because it was the tough ones that had the, the big, powerful countries, the ones that can do destruction. And uh, when you look at what's going on now with the word nuclear, it's being thrown about every day. Every hour you hear nuclear, nuclear. You didn't hear that at all for four years when I was there. You don't discuss that word. That word is a bad word. A bad word, Mark, mm -hmm. because the power is so unbelievable. This isn't a world war. This is the end of the world. I don't call it World War III. I call it the end of the world. And we have people that have no idea what they're talking about or what they're doing. I look at now what's happening with Russia and the United States. They just grabbed a reporter, which is unheard of. They just, they're holding now a reporter. I guess that hasn't happened in many decades. Uh, what's going on? We are at, in my opinion, because of the power of weaponry, mostly nuclear, but other things also, we are in the most dangerous position we've ever been in as a nation right now. And we have a leader that just doesn't know what's going on. We have, he just doesn't know what's going on. And we want to be nice about it. Everybody wants to be nice about it. But the world is at, at balance. And this country what might not exist. I mean, we may not exist anymore. Because we're talking about power of weapons that is so unbelievable. I know better than anybody, because I got to see it. And we have people that don't understand that. And they, they talk tough when they should be nice, and they talk nice when they should be tough. I mean, it's the opposite. Everything you see they say is just wrong. And it's a very scary time for this country. And it's scary primarily because of the leadership. I had I get great relationships with all of them. Uh, President Xi was very close to me. He was right here. He was right in this room. We spent a whole weekend together at Mar-a-Lago. And we had tremendous talks. I made an incredible trade deal. Then COVID came along. I don't even talk about it. It was one of the greatest trade deals ever made. Gave our farmers and manufacturers $50 billion. I got $28 billion cash for our farmers, where they literally wrote out checks to my China did. Nobody wants to talk about it. I got $28 billion for our farmers. That's why the farmers like me. That's why I'm not losing Nebraska and I'm not losing Iowa, because they got I mean, nobody ever even thought it was possible. $28 billion I got because they were taken advantage of and hurt by China. And I got it back in the form of taxes, tariffs, and other things, and with hundreds of billions left over. And no other president got 10 cents. And yet I got along with President Xi incredibly well. But I was stopping the rampage. It was the rape of America. That's what it was. It was the rape of America, what China was doing to us. And we had people leading that had no clue. They had no clue. I'm telling you, not 10 cents did we get from China. I got hundreds of billions of dollars. And I gave 28 billion of it to the farmers, because they were really taken advantage of and hurt by China. And many other things. I mean, just USMCA, that's Mexico, Canada. Got rid of NAFTA, one of the worst, probably the worst trade deal ever made. It was so one-sided. Now Canada and Mexico want to renegotiate the deal, because it's a great deal. We shouldn't do it, by the way, because, you know, for many years, they. They took advantage of us. And now we have a very good deal. I call it a fair deal, but they want to renegotiate it, meaning they're not happy. And nobody thought that was possible. But I would say it was peace through strength. I would say that they viewed us as a strong country. I think they probably didn't really figure me out because, you know, they were concerned about things. Uh, zero chance that Putin would have gone into Ukraine. I used to talk about it. But he knew not to go in, and he wouldn't have gone in. They don't respect our country anymore. They don't respect our leadership anymore. 
I had Iran in a position where they would have made a deal within one week after the election. Instead, they've become very rich. And I, saw, I told China, if you buy oil from Iran, they were buying massive amounts. If you buy oil, you're not going to do any business with the United States. And they were ripping us off for $507 billion. We had a trade deficit with China, $507 billion. I said, you buy any, any oil at all from Iran. And I said that to numerous other countries also. And Iran was coming to the table. They were dying to make a deal. And what I did, getting us out of that horrible Iran nuclear deal, I, that was one of the best things I did for Israel. Between Golan Heights and between the embassy and Jerusalem, the capital, everything I did for Israel, the best thing I did was getting them out of that horrible Iran nuclear deal. The problem is the new administration blew it. They blew it. And they allowed Iran to have a nuclear weapon. We have people that truly don't know what they're doing. This is the most dangerous time in the history of our country. And people talk about an election in a little while. You know, it's getting closer. But even if you said a year and a half, that's a long time. Because the most dangerous things now are happening. More dangerous. Did you see the other day where Putin is moving nuclear weapons right. into Belarus? Okay? Nobody ever talks about that. They say, we're going to go there, we're going to do this, we're going to give a couple of bucks. And if you remember, I'm the one that gave the javelins to Ukraine. I gave all of the javelins, that's the anti-tank missiles, I gave them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Obama gave them sheets. Did you ever hear it? I gave javelins, he gave sheets. When I spoke to uh, the head of the Taliban, Abdul, I said, Abdul, you're killing a lot of people. Under Obama, they were doing snipers all over the place and killing our boys and killing our women and killing a lot of other people. It was very bad. And I said, you got to get this guy. I want to speak to this guy. And I took a lot of heat that I would speak to him. I tell the story, Jesse James, why do you rob banks? Jesse, why do you rob banks? He says, that's where the money is. Why do I speak to Abdul? From Because that's where the death is. That's where he was killing people. And I said, Abdul, great to speak to you. If you do any more killing, if you kill one more of our soldiers, we're going to hit you harder than anybody has ever been hit. And he actually said to me, but why, but why do you send me a picture of my home? I said, you'll have to figure that one out for yourself, Abdul. You'll have to figure that one out for yourself. Or ask one of your wives. From that point forward, we didn't have one soldier even shot at, not one soldier killed. And then, when I was gone, they did the withdrawal. Millie should be court-martialed. They did a withdrawal where the people — think of this, Mark. This is where the soldiers came out first. If you asked a five-year-old child strategy, the soldiers, the soldiers come out last. They were so afraid of our F-16s and our fighter jets. We had brand new. I rebuilt the whole the whole thing. I had brand new, gorgeous stuff. We had stuff that was 48 years old. They were so afraid of it. They would just run back when they heard this with those engines. Now they own those planes. They own those planes, Mark. And I said to these people when I was getting ready to pull out, I said, I want every nail, I want every screw, I want every bolt. I want all the canvas from the tents. What do you mean the tents, sir? I want those big, massive tents. They're like hangers with canvas uh, covers, steel. I want all of that. I want the tanks. I want the planes. I want the guns. I want everything. I don't want you to leave a screw or a bolt. And then Millie said to me, sir, I think it's easier if we left and left everything. I said, why? It's cheaper. I said, so let me ask you, we have a $150 million airplane. We have to fill it up with the tank of gas, put a little fuel in there. You say it's cheaper to leave the plane than it is to fly it to Pakistan and then take it back home, or fly it to some other place that we get along with and take it back home, or fly it directly? We're going to give them a hundred million, hundred and fifty million dollar plane? Mm -hmm. Because you think it's cheaper? It's not cheaper. These are stupid people we have. These are stupid people. They take the military out before we take our hostages out, because they're hostages. The American people now are hostages. The book is Letters to Trump, 45books.com. It's a great book. I recommend you grab it. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.